The following audio drama is rated R and is recommended restricted for anyone under the age of 17. You're listening to The Breeding Mound by Mitchell Luty, performed by Scott Miller and Anna Capraro, produced by Citadel Studios for Sentinel Creatives. The honey lager was smooth and delicious after the flat beer and mulled wine they'd become used to on the front. And before long, Jens felt a warm buzz and a smile broke out on his face. They were nearly home. Come on! Diedrich grabbed him by the arm, pulling him to his feet, their earlier disagreement all but forgotten. He shoved another tot of aquavit into his hand. Schleswig may have fallen, but we are still Danes, eh? He slammed Jens on the back and raised his glass to the table, toward the laughing farm girls and the old couple, as deep into their cups as Jens and Diedrich were. To God's chosen people. To Denmark! Jens roared, knocking back his own shot. The liqueur was like fire in his belly, and he felt his head spin as the spicy drink took hold. Diedrich threw an arm over his shoulder, half leaning, half supporting him, and winked down at the farm girls. How do you two feel about dancing with a couple of war heroes? Jens had hardly blinked when he found himself in the middle of the longhouse hall, his body rocking to the beat of the drum, his arms pumping to the spasmodic rhythm of the violin. The benches had emptied, and the townsfolk crowded the back of the hall beneath a small stage the musicians occupied. They laughed, clapped, and sang as they jostled with one another for space. Diedrich was laughing too, his limp all but forgotten as he sang along with the two elderly folk from their table. He'd spilt honey lager down his front, and his beard sparkled with moisture. But he was happier than Jens had seen him in years, and his laughter made him grin all the wider. Then the girl was in front of him, her crown of flowers tilting with her head as she curtsied. She held out a hand, and Jens took it before he could even pause to think. The honey lager and aquavit were coursing through his veins, pumping his heart in time with his feet. This was not the time for thinking. The crowd whooped as he spun the fair-skinned forest princess in a pirouette, too bold for a sober Jens. She spun across the floor, graceful as a nymph, her own smile lighting up their corner of the hall. And then she was in his arms, laughing into his chest, her hands gripping him tight. Jens thought he heard his brother say something over the music, but he ignored him, closing his eyes as his hands went to the girl's waist. He felt her respond, nudging up against him until they were one writhing, sweating form, dancing on the path the music set for them. He could smell the flowers in her hair and inhaled her fragrance deeply. She smelt of wet pine and needles, like the forest after rain. He pictured her naked then, beneath him, all but her flower crown discarded on the floor at her feet, then her mouth forming an O as they became one. His hands cupped her tightly, pulling her closer still. His fingers played along her hips, moving up her lithe body of their own accord. He felt her skin, warm and smooth beneath his touch, promising him more. She was breathing into the nook of his neck, and he shivered as his manhood began to stir in his trousers. But he felt no shame. This was not the time for shame. He inhaled her scent again, marvelling at her fragrance, at how it drew him into the forest around them. But there was something else beneath the aroma of pine and rain, and he struggled to recognise it. His brow wrinkled, and then he flinched, finally placing the familiar stench. It stunk like the trenches, like his brother's corpse when they dragged it back across the mud. It threatened to overwhelm him, a heady mix of musk and death. He tried to recoil, to pull away from the girl. His hands felt wet against her skin, which was no longer smooth but matted, covered in damp fur like that of a dog. He snapped his eyes open, lurching back a step, 
pushing her away with more force than he intended. The girl gasped, falling to the floor with a soft cry. She stared up at him with a look of hurt in her eyes and started pulling herself up to her feet. Wait! Jens called as she turned her back on him, pushing her way through the crowd. What's wrong? <laughs> Diedrich chortled from beside him, the other sister's arms wrapped around his waist, a flagon of lager in each of his hands. Jens shook his head and let out a deep breath. It felt like he'd been holding it forever. Nothing. I'm going out for a piss. He'd drunk too much. He knew that, even before he stepped into the cool night air outside the longhouse, and his head started to ache. His vision had blurred. He thought, before he'd pushed the girl away, he'd seen something. A shadow. Curving horns raised from the crown of flowers. Black nails and fiery eyes. It had been in the space before a blink, a moment within a moment. He shook his head, ridding himself of the vision until all he saw was the hurt in her eyes when he'd shoved her to the ground. He'd drunk too much, that was all. He took the steps down from the longhouse carefully, not trusting his own balance anymore. He spared the runes a glance but looked away when they started to move, blurring into one, making his head pound more than it already was. After another deep breath, he wandered away from the warm glow of the longhouse and started unbuckling his belt. Jens, you idiot, he muttered, dropping his trousers to piss into the night. Dancing like a fool with some farmer's daughter, you're... A woman's scream cut through the night, making bristles out of the hair on the back of his neck. Wolf, he thought, already buckling his belt. The wolf had gotten into Foderbjerg and had already found its first victim. He remembered the carcass in the woods. Only gristle and bone had remained. Another scream rent the air, a blood-curdling cry of pain that faded into an almost breathless moan, like the last bit of wind through a ravine. Jens glanced back at the longhouse, but the music and laughter continued. They hadn't heard the cry. He considered going inside and raising help, but they were all as drunk as he was, and by the time he'd rallied them outside, it might already be too late. When the scream came again, Jens was already running toward it. His head started to clear with each stride he took, his mind clearing as adrenaline pumped through his veins. His shambling run turned into long, purposeful strides. He drew his hunting knife. He came to a stop by the town well. His head tilted as he listened for another cry, or the slopping sound of a predator gorging itself on its victim. He would need to chase it away if that were the case, to save something for the family to bury. But the streets were empty, and there was no sign of the beast and its hapless victim. There are no wolves left in Funen, Jens thought, his brow knitted. But who had screamed? And why? He stared down the nearest road at the neat houses that lined either side of it. They were quiet and dark their inhabitants feasting in the longhouse with the rest of the town. His gaze came to a rest in the garden they had passed before dinner, where Björund had said the first Lindorm had been found, a giant snake that feasted on the spines of those it caught in its venomous fangs. Jens shivered. He briefly considered peeking over the rim of the well, where the serpent was said to have come from, and then felt foolish for the thought. He was about to turn back around and take a slow walk back to the longhouse when a faint light appeared on the road ahead. It hovered in the middle of the street, floating for a moment while Jens squinted at the silhouette in the shadows behind it. A young woman, he thought, in a flowing white dress. Even in the dark, Jens felt their eyes meet, and then she was gone, darting across the street into one of the houses on the other side. Wait! Jens called for the second time that night. If there was something hunting these streets, he'd be damned if he let another victim fall to its teeth. Or fangs. He hurried along the road, inhaling the night as he scrambled through the dark. Finally, he came to a stop in front of the building he'd seen the girl disappear into. It wasn't a house like he'd first thought, but rather the entrance to the town's solitary church. Its twin doors hung slightly ajar, 
and a soft glow spilt out onto the doorstep. Jens thought he saw a shadow move within and took a cautious step forward. It wasn't his place to intrude at this hour, but there was a wolf about, and he'd heard something. Damn it, Jens, he swore, suddenly aware that he was in no fit state to visit a house of the Lord. He cupped his hand over his mouth, checking his breath. It stunk like lager and spirits and faintly of the sweat he'd never get out of his clothes. It would have to do, he thought, lurching up the church steps. His head was starting to spin again, and he had a horrifying thought that he might be welcomed into the church, only to spew his dinner all over the floor. But before he could knock or call out, he heard a gasp from behind the door and the faint moans of a woman in great pain. He was too late. He threw his shoulder against the door, swinging it wide as he stumbled into the church foyer. But instead of a woman struck down by a wolf, white dress rendered red by tooth and claw, he found himself staring at rows of cots. They lined both sides of the walls and every spare inch of the church itself. Almost two dozen of them, he guessed, forming aisles like pew benches, with just enough space to walk between. Another moan filled the church, and Jens's eyes grew wide as he noticed the occupants. Each of the beds held a woman, naked but for a thin strip of cloth that covered their breasts. Their swollen bellies jutted out of them like fleshy mountains, engorged by the life they carried. Jens covered his nose to the stink that greeted his entrance, like sour milk and shit. The smell clawed at his nose and he nearly gagged. He clenched his jaw, just managing to maintain his composure, even as the honey lager and aquavit sloshed about his insides. After a moment, he glanced down at the nearest cot, flinching at the shape that moved within the belly of the woman who occupied it. Her child was kicking, pressing against the flesh chamber that had nurtured it for so long. Sweat covered the woman's brow, and her face was pale, but a thin smile played about her lips when she saw Jens staring. She didn't seem to care that she was naked, and he a man. He averted his gaze, embarrassed by her lack of shame. As his head turned away, his eyes caught on something at the foot of her bed, and he paused to look, knowing he should have left as soon as he'd stepped inside the church. But curiosity had him now. A knotted string of what looked like leather had been tied to the bedpost. It was covered with beads and tiny teeth. As Jens's eyes adjusted to the gloom, he realized the cord was made of coarse, dark hair. Human hair, not leather at all. And that a pair of thin, nearly translucent bones hung from the end of it. He glanced up at a sharp squawk from the other side of the hall. A red-faced woman was bearing down on him from between the aisles. A cry came from behind her, and Jens saw another midwife hunched over one of the church's occupants, her arms bloodied up to her elbows. There was something in her hands, a red smear, limp and lifeless. Another cry came from the bed, but not of pain this time, but despair as the mother looked down on her twisted child, dead before its first breath. Jens tried to say something to the midwife storming toward him, but she wrung her hand at him like a priest in service each sharp movement accompanied by a string of words he couldn't hear or understand. Then one of her wrinkled hands wrapped around his arm, her grip as strong as a mason's. She pushed him back toward the door, still squawking. He blinked and found himself outside again, in the cold, dark night air. You've been listening to The Breeding Mound by Mitchell Lutie, performed by Scott Miller and Anna Capraro. Production copyright for Sentinel Creatives. Hello, I'm John Bell of Bells in the Bat Free. It's a comedy podcast. Fridays and every other Sunday, 
well, anyway, back in episode five of Bells in the Bad Free, we introduced the cowlets, tiny little cows. Where did all these cats come from? They're not cats, they're cows, and they're heading toward the water cooler. Stop it before... Now you can display your love of these tiny cows with genuine cowlet t-shirts. You know what's really fun to do with these shirts? Get a whole bunch of people to buy them. Then you all gather together and run down the street. People will see these cowlets coming toward them and think it's a stampede. You think that would really work, Brad? Shh, I'm pushing for bulk sales here. You can also get cowlet mugs, clocks, and other items. Just go to thebatfree.com and click on shop. This is a limited time offer. No, it's not. You just do not not understand advertising, do you? Get your merchandise today with the official Cowlet design created by Jeff Music. Buying lots of them would bring music to my ears. Oh, stop. 